Welcome to This Week in Money, and happy Canada Day, Independence Day weekend. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. The S&P hit new highs for the year, but will that strength continue? He also takes a look at the U.S. and Canadian dollars, crude, and gold. Ross also has a special offer for our listeners. Veteran trader Victor Adair gives us his take on the economy and does the world have enough resources to give everyone a first world lifestyle. He also tells us just how big Apple is compared to the Canadian stock market. Publisher of the realestatetiming.com newsletter Robert Campbell joins us from San Diego to talk U.S. real estate, how much money you have to make to afford a home in California, and the deep hole commercial real estate is facing. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY on the OTCQB AMYZF and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclico.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter, at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Happy Canada Day. Happy Independence Day. Oh, isn't this a nice, extended, long weekend in North America? So they... Uh, you know, I don't know why the Canadians are having a holiday on Monday. Wasn't uh, Friday closer to July the 1st? Well, anyway... And then Americans are probably going to just kick off their summer with uh, a long weekend and uh, and enjoy the uh, the weather uh, if they're as long as they're not too far north and don't have to deal with all the uh, um, the air pollution that we're sending down there from these forest fires. Wow, mm. pretty rough summer all yeah. around. In my per perfect world, Canada Day and Independence Day would just automatically be an automatic four day weekend. Right. Shared by Canada and the U.S. Yes. Yeah, and so as we go into long weekends, I think back to the Fosback book. Uh, Norm wrote a really good back book in the 1970s uh, about market action around long weekends and uh, how you tend to get that bullish movement into and through the next one or two days after a long weekend. And, and here we are, um, S&P ending up... Uh, with a correction for, from uh, uh, a week and a half ago into the 26th, um, kissed its 20-day moving average, which is usually the, the first support that you see within a rising trend, and that one held on on the 26th, and as of the close of the week, we're, we're at new highs for the move, still well off of where we were in uh, December of 2021, but it's been a pretty good move off the bottom, and if we look at the NASDAQ, you got the same idea here. Uh, the uh, upside exhaustion 10 days ago pulled back to the 20-day moving average, and it's not at a new high close. Well, it's a weekly high close, but uh, not on a daily basis. But trend is up. Um, the key now is that uh, little test of support we had uh, at the uh, early part of the week there on the 26th. And let's see how what happens after the uh, extended weekend here. If uh, if there's some failures, a bit of a rolling pattern, we could be looking at uh, deeper correction. And if we look at uh, if you look at the Dow and the, the Russell 2000, those two indices um, have not had the same strength. Um, they are still sitting below the levels that we saw at the end of the year. The Dow gave us some nice oversold signals. Different signal than we saw. Uh, not, well, actually, we didn't get any signals on the S&P and the uh, on NASDAQ. But in the Dow and in the Russell, good oversold signals into the 26th. Nice bounce on Thursday, Friday. So once again, that low that we put in early in the week is just pretty 
much critical for all four of those major indices. What's going on with gold? Uh, pretty good week here. Actually, not so much in the early part of the week, but to uh, finish off the week with a, a nice run uh, on uh, t- uh, turnaround on Thursday and some upside re- reversals on Friday. The um, price here on the cash, uh, we're looking at uh, probably the 19. 19- 45 to 1960 range is a pretty good resistance above us right now. I think there's a nice chance that we'll go up and, re- and test that level at this point. We saw the both the daily and the weekly charts produce some nice signals this uh, at the tail end of this week. And if we look at the fact that uh, silver did not break down and make new lows this week, it, it held with a marginally higher low so that uh, when we look at that, silver holding relative to gold. And we look back for other examples like that. We do see that uh, back uh, six months ago, we had one of those pieces of action similar to this, much, much bigger in terms of the time frame across the lows. But that gave us a pretty big run in gold, about a $200 run. This one's a very, very small uh, bullish divergence, I would say, over three or four days. That's, as I say, probably capable of pushing us into the uh, resistance that's above us right around that 50-day average. And um, from there, I really think that we're still in a consolidation phase. Going to have to do some more basing in here before we're uh, ready to take out that uh, high at 2050. That's a a pretty big overhang, and I think it's going to take quite a bit longer to consolidate and be ready to challenge that point. What's happening with the U.S. and Canadian dollars? U.S. dollar just bouncing around this week, and uh, we ended up with a pretty small range altogether. Thursday, Friday, decent rally, but gave it back. That, in turn, gave us a little bit of a bounce as far as the precious metals were concerned. But uh, we're, we're sitting here right into this middle of this trading range. So anything in the 102 to 104 range is, I think, all that we're looking for at this point. A little bit of an upside bias uh, towards the upper end of that range, but nothing dramatic. Uh, The Canadian dollar um, originally was getting uh, a bias here and support because of uh, the movement we had a week or two ago in the grains. But those grains after getting uh, just a massive rally off the commitment of traders' numbers, have given back all, virtually all of the gains. And with that, the Canadian dollar has settled back as well. The, um, the dollar index, if we look at it, there was a breakout around the 75 and a quarter level. And we're back to 75 and a half right now. If it holds at the 75, which would be pretty much a a nice resistance line that it uh, did manage to punch through. If it can hold there at 75, might not do food badly in the uh, the near term. Anything happening with crude? Uh, Yeah, um, still once again in the trading range. Looked as though it might have been ready to break down uh, in the early part of the week, but nope, that's not the game as of yet. We are still stuck below the uh, both the 20 and the 50 week moving averages and as far as the technicals are concerned we are looking at that 20 week moving average as the big overhang right now and um, that's it gives us something in that 73 and a half to 74 dollar range we closed off the week at uh, 70 and a half so there's a bit of upside room still left there the uh, the best thing that could happen from our perspective is to get this one final washout on the downside. You know, we uh, we topped out here with eh, pretty much a double top February of last year against June of last year, and so since then it's been a slow erosion. And the best way to uh, finish the downside move is with some uh, significant price action. Just clean everybody out. And if we look over at the uh, commitment of traders' numbers, there's nothing dramatic in there right now to say that uh, the low is in place. And as a matter of fact, if I look across the board in the COT numbers uh, as of the end of the week, there really isn't anything there. I had hoped that uh, in the precious metal, something like the gold, we would have seen a a better clean out. But the COT numbers were only about 10,000 lower for both the the commercial and spec uh, commitments there really need to see a, a number more like thirty or 40,000 on the clean-out 
to uh, put in what I would say would be a, a lasting low as far as the gold and silver are concerned. Ross, thank you so much for the update, and have a great long weekend. You too, and uh, let uh, the uh, listeners know that we have a few more days left on the special, 25% off through the U.S. long holiday, so we'll call that July the 4th. My guest has been Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at ChartsByRoss. Coming up, Victor Adair, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Victor Adair, recently retired from nearly 50 years of being in the brokerage business in B.C., but still very active in the markets. He's speaking to us from beautiful Parksville on Vancouver Island. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Jim, it's uh, always good to visit with you. Thank you. Before we discuss the different markets you trade, what's your macro view? What are the big issues that impact all the markets? And how do you see those macro views evolving in the second half of this year? Well, uh, let's see. <laughs> Where do we start on that one? I, I guess, uh, you know, I'm going to just go stream of consciousness on you here, but I guess kind of start with, I think we had maybe 20 years or so of deflation after China you know, joined the World Trade Organization, and, and Asia sort of developed, and uh, a lot of jobs went overseas, and we had globalization and all that sort of thing. So, you know, I mean, the, the economists could give you a chapter and verse. I'm just talking as a trader. Um, that seemed to be a, a, a very big deal, and there were, there were call, not so much deflation, but at least we didn't have inflation for that period of time. I think now we have inflation. Um, so, okay, that's pretty obvious, you know, but really since maybe the thing from my perspective that kicked that off was the reactions of the central banks and certainly the governments uh, to COVID. I mean, we had just um, call it massive money printing and people people had money put into their bank accounts. You know, they didn't have, didn't have to <laughs> mail them a check. They just were able to do that. Uh, the central banks took interest rates negative in the parts of the world, um, and we just entered a, a new era. And I, I would think that this will, if it's an era, you know, it's not going to just be a two-year deal. It's going to run for longer than that. So I think we're in a new era in terms of we've gone from not so much a deflation, but at least a level kind of period of time for two decades or so, and now we're, we've swung into what's, what I believe will be a more inflationary environment. Um, you know, we had a decade plus uh, before this swing to inflationary period of, of zero interest rates. And now we're going to have higher interest rates. And some people, some companies that kind of got addicted or required uh, zero interest rates are, are going to struggle, to say the least, in in the new world here where interest rates are a lot higher. Um, you know, some things won't survive. But we got a, a new record high world population. I don't know what it is, at eight and a half billion or something. I mean, who's counting is just a lot of people out there and a lot of them are living in what's called the developing world as opposed to, you know, the G seven countries and those folks in a colloquial kind of a way are gonna want some of the things that we have, you know, the kind of lifestyle we have, the uh the T Vs and the, the, the toilets and you know, and freeways and blah blah blah, all that stuff and so, you know, that's going to, let's say, I'm not going to be Malthusian on you, but it's going to strain uh, uh, the distribution of resources as we, around the world. And I think, you know, it's going to be exciting. It'll probably be scary for some people and uh, and may, uh, may have consequences, certainly, for others. Uh, I think we've also been in an era here, and this makes me feel a little grim, actually, where it seems we're going to uh, more and more intrusive government uh you know some of the draconian measures that were taken during covid you know thou shalt not go out in public without being blah 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 you know with a mask on and 
stay 20 feet away from everybody else and stay home and do this and do that. And if you don't, we'll just take money out of your bank account and the hell with you. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm exaggerating, but, you know, I think we have moved to more and more intrusive governments. I would call it a, a socialist command kind of uh, society where uh, people want the government to do more and the politicians that get elected understand that and say hey if you vote for me i'll give you more so you know we 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 have that everybody looks to the government to solve all the problems i'm not saying we want to go back to whatever it was before uh, i'm a realist as a trader I just try to see things as they are rather than i think they should be but yeah i think um you know i'm an older person uh, i will be 74 this year i have some Things that I sort of took for granted, I guess, and that some of those things probably won't be taken for granted in the future. So, yeah, things keep changing, and, you know, change makes markets change, and I suppose as a trader, uh, I should embrace that. The mega cap stocks have led the stock market higher this year, and Apple's the leader of the mega cap stocks, the so called Magnificent Seven. What are your views? Well, let me give you a, a stat. Uh, I just actually looked this up uh, late this week. Um, Apple, there was a bit of a fanfare. Apple went to a three trillion U.S. dollar market capitalization. Okay, I'll get right to the punch. I looked it up. The entire Toronto Stock Exchange is worth about three trillion dollars U.S. in market cap. It, it's actually four trillion dollars Canadian, but since it's seventy-five cents on the dollar. Apple has the same market cap as the entire Canadian stock market. Just for just for perspective, I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, if you put Apple and Microsoft together, they represent 15% of the S&P. You'd throw in the other uh, five guys in the uh, Magnificent Seven, as you just uh, we were just talking about. Um, that's 30% of the uh, S&P. So, yeah, I mean, everybody knows this. I, I put different charts up on my blog every week, I guess, uh, kind of pointing this out, how if it, if you took a handful <laughs> of stocks, of uh, the top guys, out of the S&P, you know, I think we're up 3 or 4% or something on the year, as it is. Maybe we're up 18%, I think, is the number year to date. And then things like Apple and Microsoft are, are up 50%, uh, you know, from where they were at the end of last year. Clearly, um, uh, mega cap tech, t- tech is leading the rally. I mean, it's it's interesting that you know Apple. Uh, I think it's not like they're having spectacular results. You know, their sales are down, their profits down, and their forecast isn't that they're going to uh, you know suddenly get a hell of a lot better. It's just a case, I think, here of if you're a money manager and folks out there that are money managers control way more money than just you know you and I taking a a position in the market you got to own apple you you can't say to people no oh, i decided i didn't want to buy apple for your account no no your your clients will, will fire you if you don't own apple so i think there's that um you know i'm skeptical i'll look at it but uh, at the same time i have learned many times um over my career that when something's just racing away to the upside don't be a smart ass and try to you know say oh it's overvalued and short it because you're probably going to lose some money so yeah it's it's spectacular what's happened um i mean i got to throw this in too in terms of things you might not have known but are kind of fun tesla is the world's most traded stock I think on the options exchange, and I might be exaggerating here, but give me a little poetic license. I think Tesla options represent about half of all the options that are traded. I mean, it's it's like that. And, oh, by the way, Tesla is up about 150% in the first six months of this year. So, yeah, it's all about tech. Uh, I notice, I talk to different people about this, that the IPO, that's the initial public offerings or, or secondary offerings, uh, are are down this year. You can see the di- different big banks and, and stock brokerage folks are are laying off, but like sending home people that work in their mergers and acquisitions department. Uh, like the money is going to the known superstars, and it's going in in a flood. And I guess it'll keep going like that uh, until it stops. Inflation has come down from its highs, but it's still well above the 2% central bank target. Does that mean interest rates will keep going up? Yeah, short answer is yes. You know, uh, I mean, the way that, and I'm, I'm going to an- just answer that as 
how the market's got a price right now. I mean, I can look at the forward strips, and I do, to see what's price, what where interest rates are figured to be in, you know, every month going out the next several years. But um, so the market right now is expecting the Bank of Canada will kick up rates by another quarter. I think it's on July the 12th is the next meeting they have. Uh, toward the end of the month, the Federal Reserve, uh, the ECB, will be having uh, another get-together, and uh, they're expected to raise rates. Actually, I think right now the market pricing is that the European Central Bank and the Fed will raise rates by another half a point before we get to December. And the U.K., which seems to, their inflation there seems to be running hotter, way hotter than other country, other areas or countries, and the Bank of England there is expected now to raise rates by another 125 basis points before the end of the year. So, yeah, uh, the inflation is up. The and I, I think I've written about this so many times in my blog. Um, you know, at the beginning of this year, the first couple of months of this year, the market was pricing that the central banks would be cutting interest rates in the second half of this year, uh, particularly the United States. And that was despite... Fed Chairman Powell saying time and again, we do not expect to cut interest rates this year. The market was saying, oh, yeah, yeah, well, we know more than you do. So now that's changed. You know, the market has come around to, okay, the, uh, the Fed is not going to cut rates this year, but starting next year, you know, they will. We'll see. I think Powell uh, really, really believes that he has to break the back, as it were, of inflation expectations. And until that happens, you know, he's going to do what he's going to do. Now, is that the right thing to be doing? I tell you what, you know, I was just having a rant there about the command economy. I think it's kind of bizarre that we have these unelected bureaucrats running the central banks who have so much power uh, to do what they do. And it's, you know, they get together in a room and say, well, what, what do you think? What do you think? Well, here's what I think. Okay, here's what I think we should do. And... You know, we get an incredibly, incredibly complex economy, and how do they measure that? How do they know? How do they, you know, you talked about, just asked me moments ago, you know, how, how are things changing? What are the big issues? I, I think, you know, it's changed so much, and the only thing it seems they can do is, you know, tight monetary policy, and they're, they're doing that by pulling liquidity out of the system, uh, unless, of course, there's a little scare like we had in March with the Silicon Valley Bank, and then they flood the system with money again, and the blunt instrument of raising interest rates. So the, the Phillips curve, as it were, would, would prescribe that the only thing that the central bank can do is to, to get inflation down is they've got to get unemployment up, and they've got to kill the economy and have a recession. Like, well, you know, before we had central banks, and, and you know, I, I understand the Bank of England goes back 400 years or whatever, but, you know, we had booms and we had busts. And the old saying is that ah, the best cure for high prices is high prices. The best cure for low prices is low prices. You know, people innovate, they adapt, they get used to, they modify, they find substitutes, whatever, and, you know, we go on. But... Um, Anyway, that's, that's a bit of how the world maybe should be the way it is. The central banks that we have are going to continue to raise interest rates until maybe if they get a scare. You know, if there is another run on the banks or another uh, credit crisis or something like that, then, you know, they'll back off. Uh, in the CPI figures, you know, taxes are not part of the calculation. Canadians pay half their income in taxes. Canada Day today... Carbon taxes across Canada are increased again by the Trudeau government, according to the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. That will add $2,000 to the living costs of the average Canadian family. But again, officially in inflation terms with government figures, that doesn't exist. Well, like, they're that, part of the problem it. here with the cost of living. Yeah, that's, that's that style of the command economy. So there are call it the, uh, the climate zealots uh, at the government level. And it occurred to me this, the other day, I was filling up my car and I noticed, you know, that, hold on, that's a higher gas price than I was used to. And then somebody reminded me they'd put through another tax. And I thought, uh, oh, wait a second, I see what's going to happen here. The climate zealots who want us to not use fossil fuels, they are just going to continue to raise taxes on the transportation fuels that we use until, you know, us dinosaurs get rid of our gas-powered cars and you know take an electric bus to work or whatever anyway I, I'm, I'm ranting a bit but I, I could just see it coming 
And, um, you know, I, I'll stop now. <laughs> well, in one day, Mount Pinatubo uh, cranked out enough carbon dioxide to cancel all the carbon credits uh, issued the last 10 years. I failed to see how a tax can attack the biggest factors in climate change, which is solar activity, the Earth's orbit and attitude, and the fact, the proven scientific fact, that climate goes in cycles. We have 100,000 years of ice and 10,000 years of warm. We're lucky to be warm. If uh, it was uh, people driving cars that causes uh, an increase in uh, temperatures, how come in Roman times it was really warm? So warm that where the glaciers are in the Alps, they didn't exist. They're finding Roman artifacts there. So, uh, you know, how humans, yes, we may be influencing it, but I'm telling you, a tax is not going to be the solution. Volcanoes don't care about taxes. Well, uh, in terms of the command economy, from my perspective, uh, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad. You've been primarily bullish on the U.S. dollar in the last two and a half years we've been doing our interviews. Save for a few months last fall when you thought it was overdue for a correction, are you still bullish on the greenback? And if you are, why? Um, you know, generally I am, yes, and uh, that's part of the way I trade is I will have a bias about a market. And then I will look for what I call setups or, or just like opportunities within the market to trade in line with that bias. Uh, other people trade differently, you know, but that's how I, I go about it. Um, so my bias is that, uh, I've, you've heard me say this many times, that capital comes to America for safety and opportunity. And sometimes safety is really important. Let's say, for instance, when you know the Russians moved into Ukraine, I think there were some capital flow that came to America. You could just imagine, and then you know there's opportunity. Uh, we just talked about the mega cap stocks; like they're all in America. You know, <laughs> relative to the rest of the world, they're all there. I mean, I know there are some here and there for all that sort of thing, but the opportunity to to like America is more often going to be at the cutting edge relative to, to other places. So, I mean, that's a pretty big picture point of view, and you can have periods of time. You could have a, a few years at a time when you know that doesn't seem to be the way things are. Certainly, uh, under Jimmy Carter, you know, there was a different world when Ronald Reagan came in, for instance, and the U.S. dollar soared. Um, I, I I have this bias then that I, I like. The, I like to look for opportunities to be a buyer of the U.S. dollar against other currencies, and uh, yeah, I'm sticking to it. The Canadian dollar traded to a nine-month high above 76 cents this week. Why, and where do you see it going? Yeah, the Canada has been uh, almost a bit of an outrider. Um, in some respects, uh, I think the world might see Canada as just like another state of the United States. And I know a lot of Canadians are going to curl their toes when they hear me say that. But, you know, forgive me. I mean, that's just I'm saying. I think a lot of people outside of North America see Canada and the United States as pretty much the same thing. Okay. Uh, so we'll get capital flow there. We've certainly seen the Mexican peso do better. And uh, let's say, you know, we can talk about the peso in real general terms. One of the reasons it's doing better is because America is going to start importing things from uh, Mexico or that are made in Mexico rather than things that were made in China. So, you know, there's, there's businesses moving operations into Mexico to sell into the United States. I think there might be something similar happen in Canada where Canada is seen next door to the United States and that's a great market or that's the last market with the lights left on and if things go bad. So Canada or even think in terms of Fortress North America, Canada, the United States and Mexico, you know, doesn't need the rest of the world for much of anything. So there may be some of that. It's Canada relative to the European currencies or Asian currencies. Speaking of Asian currencies, I've seen, I was looking at the uh, offshore Chinese RMB, uh, earlier this week, and I see it's for the last year or so, it's almost tracked the, uh, the Japanese yen. So there's some some homogeneity in, in how the Asian currencies are going. And by the way, they're going down uh, against uh, the U.S. dollar and against the Canadian dollar. Um, Canada, I mean, here's something I just got drawn to my attention, and I couldn't believe it, how much our population has jumped. I guess we, we have a fairly open door uh uh, immigration policy, and you know, I'm not here to debate whether that's good or bad. That's just what is. 
but uh, maybe Canada isn't the Canada that we, you know, used to think it was, uh, and, and things are, are changing. What I, I, in, I'm trying to answer the why, okay? I mean, you've heard me say before that Canada will, if, if the United States is up, the U.S. dollar is up against most currencies, then it's probably up against Canada. There's that. Mm-hmm. The interest rate differential between Canada and the United States is important from time to time. Lately, it's been a bit of a in play, particularly when it seemed like the Bank of Canada was, was more aggressive than the Fed and vice versa. Uh, and Canada's a commodity play in some respects. So over big periods of time, the Canadian dollar moves pretty much in harmony with the, the commodity indices. Um, and you know, Canada certainly on a day-to-day basis, there's a high correlation with the my my favorite barometer of risk on risk off sentiment, which is the S and P 500 uh, futures contract. So, if the American stock market's bid, Canada's probably bid as well. So, uh, that's maybe all I know about why. Uh, I don't know that there's any political issue. You know, that's unique to Canada. That's making Canada bid, unless maybe it has something to do with the the immigration that we're having. There, the 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 growth of our of our population. Uh, it seems the Canadian population has spiked higher in the past year or so, while uh, the American population remains pretty much the same. So I don't think we just had a lot of babies. I think there's new people came to the country. Um, where do I see it going from here? Uh, I, honestly, after all that, <laughs> I mean, I've been I've been trading the Canada uh, from the short side with my short-term trading, and uh, I was short Canada this week, made money doing that, and going into the long weekend. I, honestly, I'm just flat. I don't have any positions on on anywhere, and I got out of my Canada. So that's all I have to say about the Canadian, I guess. Well, Canada officially now 40 million people. I could see how the world would pay more attention to a nation of 40 million than the 20 million we were in 1967. Yep. Just and population we're, we're alone will generate economic activity. Yep. Gold prices spiked to all-time highs in 2020 when governments and central banks worldwide reacted to the COVID crisis with aggressive fiscal and monetary stimulus. Gold made a new high on geopolitical concerns when Russia invaded Ukraine. Then in early May, it made a new all-time high when it looked like central banks might be ready to stop raising interest rates. But... Since early May, gold fell nearly 200 bucks, touched a four-month low this week. What's going on with gold? Um, well, I think certainly the high in 2020 uh, was very much, as you say, in reaction to fiscal and monetary policy just being very aggressive. You know, they printed money like there was no tomorrow. I mean, uh, and it drove interest rates right down. That's nirvana for gold. Uh, real interest rates certainly went negative. In some places, even nominal interest rates went negative. Then uh, the one in um, uh, last year when Russia went into Ukraine, I mean, gold has a classic uh, reaction function to geopolitical crisis and something like that. Holy mackerel, you know, <laughs> Russia just invaded one of their neighbors. What's next? You know, do they keep rolling all the way to the English Channel? Who knows? Uh, so, you know, that was a classic gold jumps or spikes on uh, on geopolitical scares. And then the, the third one, and and the, that high on the, it was on the 4th of May, and it was a flash in the pan. I mean, uh, it's so recent, I remembered it seared into my memory, actually. We, it late in the afternoon, uh, West Coast time, so almost like dinner time uh, on the East Coast, uh, the, we have the secondary or uh, sort of off-market uh, trade in gold, uh, it, it spiked about $30 uh, in a couple of minutes and, and, and fell back. And, uh, yeah, it was tied to uh, an expectation in the market, particularly showed up in the credit markets, that, hey, the Fed might be done. You know, they might stop raising rates. Well, uh, that turned out not to be the case. <laughs> And also, another thing that drove us to the, uh, those uh, very, very briefly, uh, we made the new all-time highs at the beginning of May, and I've been, again, chronicling this in my blog. Um, one of the things that put a real bid in the gold market uh, earlier this spring or late winter was the news that was spreading around that central banks were buying gold hand over fist or at least were reporting that they were buying hand over fist. I mean, the Bank of China, the Bank of Russia had been, let's say, anything but transparent in what they were doing with gold. I mean, China is the world's largest miner of gold. 
Russia's the second one. You know, Canada's, I think, third. The United States is the fourth. So they're buying a lot of their own gold. God knows if the folks that were mining it were getting a fair price, but that's another story. Anyhow, uh, the, gold, the gold crowd got kind of all excited that, hey, central banks are, you know, now stockpiling gold again. And, of course, these are the same folks that, you know, uh, prior to that might have told you that they think central banks are some of the dumbest people in the world, so why would they be following them? But, but there you go. When somebody's singing your song, you think they're great. Um, so the central bank buying of gold had got the gold crowd excited. Uh, the, the prospect, certainly, of uh, interest rates uh, going down, and don't forget, you know, the beginning of May was just six weeks after we'd had the banking crisis in the United States with the Silicon Valley, and then other banks, including Credit Suisse, getting into trouble and being taken over. The the gold market, uh, what I saw was that the the share of the buying of gold on the COMEX futures in New York was uh, the the retail crowd, in my language, they, they were buying the highs. And when we made the high on May the 4th, then the next couple of days it traded a little, down a bit, the, the retail buying increased. And I could see this in the open interest. And then the next six weeks or whatever, the folks that were buying the highs were liquidating their positions, and open interest really fell off dramatically. So there was, just to sum up, uh, and it was kind of uh, almost like divorced from what was going on in the currency market. We've talked before that gold usually does well if the U.S. dollar is weak. When the U.S. dollar was kind of neutral, uh, geopolitical crises uh, fuel the gold market, and then there's this positioning. And the positioning was retail bought the highs, and when the market started to come off, uh, they were sellers. So it come off. Not quite two hundred dollars from the all-time highs uh, in early May. Uh, the market seems to be finding a little footing here, uh, but I think there's something else that's been in play. I mean, and let me spit it out. I mean, who who wants to go buy a bar of gold when you can buy a share of Apple? You know, I mean, it's it's just yeah. that simple in some respects. Uh, there's just more mm-hmm. interesting things uh, for money to chase, and uh, lately they're they're chasing all uh, the tech stocks, and you know, gold is like. Um, dancing with your grandmother (laughs) for the past few years many analysts have predicted that prices for things like copper would skyrocket as the world moves away from fossil fuels after all it takes 83 kilos or 183 pounds of copper to make an electric car that's 277 percent more than the typical internal combustion engine car however copper prices haven't zoomed to the stars why not well, isn't that an interesting question? Now, why not? Um, I, I, I'll tell you, let me give you an anecdote. I remember uh, years ago I started working in an office with a, another broker. I didn't know him very well, another commodity trader. And uh, I saw that he was getting just buried on a trade that he had on. And I'm, I'm not going to say what the trade was, but it was a, a spread in the currency markets. So it was a little off-the-run kind of a thing. And like day after day, this market was moving against him. And I was perplexed as to why he stood it. And I could hear him on the phone with his client, you know, I've got to hang into this thing because I know it's going to turn around and so on and so on and so on. And then one morning I was having a shower before I headed down to work, and it just the, the light bulb went off in my mind. I thought, oh, I got it right. He's a stockbroker. He's not a commodity broker, and the guy did some commodity business, but most of his life he'd been a stockbroker. And one of my sayings, and I've got some very dear friends that are stockbrokers, so please forgive me, guys, but one of my sayings was stockbrokers are people who believe and tell stories. So the story around copper was fantastic. You know, it takes 10 years to bring a mine into into production if you have if you could find one, you know, a big one, and they're hard to find. The, you know, the, the 10 years is all the permitting and so on and so on and so on. Like there is there is going to be this huge demand from the electrification of everything for copper, and on the other side, there's going to be no supply because we found all the copper there is and there's not enough. So prices have to go up. You know, that was the story. Well. They didn't. I mean, they, they did. They went to five dollars, and now we're at three dollars and change. And if anything, it would seem we're going into electrification more than ever, and so on. So why not? Well, you know, I said earlier about the best cure for high prices are high prices, and one of the things that happens when prices go higher is that 
people innovate or they find substitutes or they do this or that or the other thing. And the folks that are, say, clinging to a story uh, are losing money. Now, the story may turn out to be true. We just got the time wrong. It might be that in a year from now, copper's $10 a pound, and they were right, you know, if they didn't lose all their money first and, you know, get kicked out of their position. Uh, so as a trader, and I'm obviously I'm being a bit flip here and maybe a bit sarcastic, but, you know, forgive me, it's a long weekend. Um, you you got to be careful about believing stories because, you know, it's it's like a narrative and it's a, it's like you're, something is assumed to be true, but it's not. So the price of copper came down. I mean, it would seem to me that there is going to be an increased demand for energy in the world, and yet, you know, we've got uh, WTI crudes trading around 70 bucks, you know, we're roughly half of the, the, where we were at the highs when Russia went into Ukraine. Now, that was a unique situation, and but, you know, where should it be? You would kind of think that it would be higher. Maybe, you know, we've got too much supply relative to demand. That's, when that happens, usually, <laughs> that's, a, that's a cause of prices going down. Maybe there's something similar going on in the copper market. I don't know, and, and one of the, the things, I guess, that's helped me be a better trader is I'm really willing to admit I don't know, uh, so I don't try to justify why, you know, my brainwave uh, is, is, is worthy of uh, staying with a trade where you're losing money. I just go, oh, this isn't working, and I'm, and I'm gone. You work for some of the most prominent American commodity brokerage firms over the past 45 years, but for the last three years, you've been quietly trading your own accounts from a small town on Vancouver Island. Do you miss the good old days, and do you trade differently now? (laughs) Well, you know, the the good old days were fantastic. I I had the opportunities to to be on the trading floor of of the, the world leading commodity exchanges in Chicago and New York. I, I might have been on the floor in Chicago 50 times, I'm sure. And I always felt like I was in everybody's way when I was down there. But it was just incredible to be in, in a room like that where there's a couple of thousand people you know, screaming their lungs out uh, and, and things are moving and, there's, and there's, no, no, there's no space. Everybody's jammed in there like a sardine. And, and it's very exciting and that stuff. And, you know, I had some fantastic client relationships uh, over the years. Uh, I, I spent a couple of years being a, a currency analyst at one of the big American firms, and that was very exciting, knowing that when I would pick up the uh, hoot and holler phone, there was a couple of hundred brokers, or several hundred brokers actually in North America and, and Europe could hear what I had to say, and, and then I would trade my own account in front of those people by entering orders that everybody could, could hear what I was doing. So that really gave me some discipline. I mean, if I said I'm, I'm buying the Deutschmark here, but my stop is going to be here, um, you know, then I, I had to I had to honor that because I would just embarrass myself if, if I didn't. So you know, there, there was lots of good things to it, and we have different phases in life, I guess. And um, you know, I mean, it seemed to me over time that the brokerage business just became more and more constrained by the compliance. Um, and particularly in my line of work, uh, the com- rules that were made up by people who had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> I mean, the, the securities commissions had no idea what commodities were really, and they were trying to regulate the business. And certainly, we, we have to have regulation. I understand it. Otherwise, you know, the thieves and crooks and shysters out there would, would rip off all the people. But um, these days... Yeah, I, I have no clients. Uh, I can get up and I, I, I've been working from home for 10 years. I've got fabulous access to the markets here with the, through the Internet. Uh, I have subscribed to all kinds of services uh, there where I get ideas and you know input. I have a great network of people I talk with or swap emails with uh, about what we're doing in the markets. Um, uh, I tell you what, in terms of trading, I certainly trade smaller than I used to, uh, trade uh, less aggressively. Um, you know, uh, I'm not willing to take the risks that I did when I was younger, and I think probably people in a lot of lines of work would say the same thing. You know, you you, you can take some pretty big chances when you're in your 30s because if you just if you blow it or blow up, you know, you can start over again. But uh, as I said, I'm going to be 74 later this year. I, I really, I mean, my wife would kill me if I lost a house, right? So um, <laughs> I'm not as aggressive as I used to be. Uh, I'm 
but I still do it. I mean, I, I'm I'm on the West Coast, but I'm in front of my screens five o'clock in the morning. I I, I want to be involved. Uh, I just find it wonderfully exciting. Um, no, that's not quite true. I mean, it, it's just what I do. I try. I, not, I tr- honestly, I try not to make it exciting. I try to just, you know. Um, uh, I guess I just try to hit singles instead of home runs, you know, to use that baseball analogy. Uh, I, I do trade differently now, and, and that's it. I'm, I'm less uh, less dramatic in my trading and uh, and probably probably hold positions longer than I used to, that sort of thing. Anyway, that's, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, Jim, but thanks for asking. Victor, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money, and have a great long weekend. You know, I'm looking forward to it, Jim. Thank you. And and as I say, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again. My guest has been Victor Adair. He's been speaking to us from Parksville on Vancouver Island. Check out his website, victoradair.ca. Coming up, Robert Campbell, next on This Week in Money. Recyclical, making lithium-ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Robert Campbell, publisher of the RealEstateTiming.com newsletter. He's speaking to us from San Diego. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Bob. Hey, thank you very much, Jim. When's the next issue of the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter coming out? I'm working on it right now. It'll be published on or before uh, July 15th. Can you tell us a bit about your book, Timing the Real Estate Market? Is it just as applicable today as the day you wrote it? Yes, it actually is. The uh, I shouldn't say actually, that the and, and I wrote it that way. Um, I, I wrote it in uh, 2002, which is, what, 23, 22 years ago, and I did a lot of research on, on real estate cycles and, and um, discovered five key indicators that are forward-looking and um, use, put those in, five indicators into a, into a real estate timing model that forecasts major turning points in the market. And they work just as well today as they did in the past. They're all based on guys. You know why they work? Because they're all based on supply and demand. <laughs> and that's what ma- that's what makes markets go up, and that's what makes markets go down. It's that simple. And if you just learn some key indicators, key indicators to use that um, that reflect uh, the the dynamics of supply and demand, you're ahead of 95% of most people with, uh, with respect to determining uh, market direction. And these indicators, and, and ideally, and these are, you want to look at forward-looking indicators, not lagging, lagging indicators. So that um, uh, three, out of, three out of five of them are definitely forward-looking indicators, and they're uh, a tremendous boost to making, you know, buy and sell decisions. This month, the Fed paused raising the bank rate. Could this be part of the interest rate waves you previously spoke about? Yeah, it is. You know that um, that, and and it looks to me that that odds are better than fifty fifty that the the Fed is going to keep raising rates too, because inflation is e- even though it's come down, it hasn't come down enough. And 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 some of the things that that you know, and you, and inflation's different things in different areas. And probably the worst of all things is, or close to it, is food. I mean, people telling me every time they go to the they go to the supermarket, they get shocked. They go, "I can't believe how much food how, how much food keeps going up." Well, because food is such a, a a necessary part of everybody's lives, and it just keeps getting more and more expensive. You can't let that get out of hand because a lot of people, you know, they're they're living they're living month to month anyway. And if all of a sudden you start can't can't get afford food anymore or it gets to be a problem, 
you got to stop that. You can't let food go out of hand like that. So it's, it's hard to say what the Fed's going to do. I know ideally they would like to drop rates and, and you know, and, um, and, and, and pump the markets up, real estate stocks and everything. But you can't do that. You, you can't do that if inflation is, is as bad as it is and it's still bad. The Competition Bureau in Canada uh, investigated rising food prices. They said the problem in Canada is the lack of competition. There's only three major companies. They own lots of brand names, but it all comes back to just three companies. But in the U.S., don't you have competition, or do you have the same thing where, in reality, only a handful of companies control all the food stores? I really don't know. I don't I, I, I don't have an answer to that and I wasn't even aware that that's the case either in Canada or the US so I can't comment on it. Yeah. Uh, are are we at the point where maybe the government's going to have to hand out ration cards to make sure people get enough food? That wouldn't surprise me. That would not surprise me. I mean they're handing out money. I mean the you know socialism just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that seems to be, and that seems to be the um, um, what what the governments, you know, um, are, are trying to uh, encourage. And so, no, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Are financial institutions constricting credit? Yes, a little bit. They are. I mean, that if, for instance, that but things haven't got bad enough yet where they're going to really contract credit. For example, unemployment is still, you know, near record lows here in the United States. You know, real estate is still, you know, has only gone down, you know, like less than 5% nationally year over year. Some areas are worse than most, and most of those areas are in California, especially Northern California, especially the San Francisco Bay Area. But so they're, they're constricting, constricting credit a little bit, but they certainly haven't pulled back on, on construction loans. And when things get bad, that's the first thing that gets hit. They pull back on construction loans because it's so risky, and that hasn't been the case yet. Does debt continue to be the elephant in the room? Absolutely. It always is, whether it's on a personal level, a state level, or a federal level. I mean, now we're up over $31 trillion, you know, and we're going to run uh, – that, that, that will at least go to probably $33 trillion, add another, add another $2 trillion this year on for $2 trillion plus of deficit spending, and it's just going to keep going up and up and up with really no end in sight. Because we live in it, we live in a, you know, the government is, is, is overspending, spending at least $2 trillion more than they take in every year. There's only one way to, that they can finance that, that uh, shortfall is, is, is float government, you know, uh, treasury bonds and the, and the Fed will print money to cover that to, so that the government can pay its bills. But it's, I really don't see a, I don't really see an end to this. And it's because most of the government spending nowadays, um, is mandatory. It's Social Security, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid compose almost 80% of the U.S. government spending. 80%. You go back 40 years ago, that number was like half. So you can't cut back on any of those things without causing a revolution. So, and now, you know, now, now interest on the national debt is approaching a trillion dollars, which is more than, more than they spend on defense. Um, the, and that's consuming a bigger and bigger pie. So as I see it, as an economist, the, what, you, what you have here is you just have a, a situation that's going to be impossible to get out of. I mean, you know, you, you need to keep deficit spending to keep the economy, you know, rolling, you know, to keep, to keep paying Medicare, to keep paying Social Security. The higher the debt, you know, and, and that deficit spending um, increases uh, the rate of inflation. Higher inflation means higher interest rates. Higher interest rates mean, mean more debt servicing. And so on and on you go. Eventually, you just got to bite the bullet and go, you know what? Okay, it's over. And you kind of, and, and you let the system collapse and, and you start over again. Is a lower crude oil price likely to bring down inflation? Well, yes, because the it absolutely is, and and that, and that's what's keeping inflation as bay as it is. I mean, you know, uh, crude oil prices here in the United States are around seventy seventy bucks a barrel or something like that, which you know, from a historical basis, you know, is you know, like in the last twenty years, leans toward the low side. 
So if we get into a situation where oil prices start going up again, which they likely will, I mean, that, that's going to add even more to the rate of inflation. Is low inventory keeping the housing market buoyant due to demand? 100%. 100%. You know, sales are down 30 to 40, 20 to 30 percent, you know, year over year um, right now. And based on, based, because that's, that's one of my key forward looking indicators, existing home sales, you'd think home prices would be lower, but they're not because the, um, the inventory of homes on the market have fallen by 20 or 30 percent year over year. So supply and demand is, is back in balance. And that's why we haven't seen uh, any any dramatic drops in prices. What could cause inventory to increase? That's a really, really good question. And that my thinking on it is something's going to happen, guys. Because it always does. Real estate is cyclical. It's more cyclical here in the United States than it is in Canada. But I've seen your charts, and I think your day of reckoning is, is in process right now. But something's going to happen. Maybe unemployment starts rising, and it won't still be at record lows. The, and all of a sudden, now people lose their jobs. And all of a sudden, that I don't care if they've got a 3% interest rate. They put a 3% interest rate on a house, on the price of a house, that was at a, um, at a record high level. So they can't afford their house. So maybe they have to start giving up their house. Other things where I think the, the, the real wild card is, is the baby boomers. There's, at least there was, there was, used to be 78 million of us. I don't know how many there are right now. But when people get older, things happen. You can get sick and people get, people get old. They need medical care. They need assistance. They go to nursery homes. 90% of, of everybody's wealth in the United States for the average person is found in his home. So all of a sudden, you're 70 years old. And all of a sudden, you come down with a medical medical condition where you need care. And either you go to a nursing home uh, that gives you, you know, semi-care for four grand a month, or if you want full care, it's eight grand a month. There's only one source of that money, and that's the equity in your home. And you're going to sell your home so that you can afford to be put up in a nursing home. And more and more people are in that situation, you know, just, just from a pure medical standpoint. They lose their health. Other people, there are other people, let, let's say you got a million dollars equity in your home and you're in good health. Maybe you'd like to travel. Maybe in the last five years you'd like to spend some of that money. Maybe your home's too big. Maybe, you know, the kids are gone, your house is 2,500 square feet, you know, you and the bride, you know, do you still need 2,500 square feet? No, in a two-story home. No, probably, you know, 1,500 would be more than adequate. Do you need a two-story home? No. I mean, you probably, a lot of people, when they get older, they can't even negotiate the stairs. So there's a, a lot of reasons, that, and it's, there's, a, there's that big, big bulge in, in the demographics called baby boomers, and there's a lot of reasons that they may be putting their house on the market um, that, you know, for reasons that, that they aren't yet aware of. How much income do people need to afford a median-priced home in California today? Oh, I would say, let's say the median price home ballpark for the entire state is in the range of probably like $800,000. Mm. So let's say you look at a 7% mortgage rate, which is probably ballpark market right now, um, and, and, and that payment. I would say household income has to be in the range of, uh, of you know, three hundred dollars to $350,000 to afford that home. Wow. Yeah, and, and you know what percentage of all households in California, and you know what the average household income in California is? It's about 100. Mm. So it's about three times too high. And, 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 and that brings up a really, really good point because that it's, you know, the, the cycles are essentially driven by supply and demand, of course. And what drives supply and demand? Affordability. Mm. Houses get so expensive. Interest rates go up or they just get up too high, and all of a sudden people are, can't afford or unwilling to spend 50% of their household income, and that's after tax, on a house. And so all of a sudden, now they get too expensive, you know, demand dries up, um, supply hits the market, and the cycle turns down. I think it was, let me see if I can get this right, that, you know, a friend of mine that we both know, he said, um, he was talking about in Toronto, for you, Cali- for you, um, uh, Canadians up there, 
You need a household income of $590,000 to afford a 1,500-square-foot uh, detached home. And the average family in Toronto makes a third of that. So is Toronto overpriced? Yeah, by about, it, it, it's, it's by a huge amount. And, so, and it's the same in California. It's the same in most places in the United States. It's the affordability. You look back at the affordability, you know, look at long-term charts and say, okay, when, the, you know, when affordability gets in a certain danger zone too high, prices go down. The cycle turns down. All of a sudden, prices come down. Nobody wants a home. You know, there's a, there's a you know, housing gets cheap. Affordability is, it becomes, um, it, you know, um, um, very strong. Prices start going up. Is a significant amount of the housing stock owned by investors, and could investors end up taking the housing market down? Well, the, here in the United States, um, I think 65% of all uh, single-family homes are owned by users, occupants. So that means 35% are owned by investors. That's a big percentage. And, and who's more likely to give up their home, give up a piece of property and walk away from it when, if a crunch comes? An investor, 100%. In the early 80s, mortgage rates roughly doubled. Since early 2021, mortgage rates have roughly tri- tripled. Generally, how long does it take for these increased rates to affect home prices? Well, that's, that's subject to a lot of interpretation, and a lot of economists will, you know, tell you this and tell you that. So I'm really not too sure of that, but, I mean, it can happen immediately. I mean, all of a sudden, rates went from 3% to 7% in how much time? What, six months? That's a, that impact's going to hit you immediately. All of a sudden, you can afford a, you can afford a $850,000 house in California at a 3% interest rate, and now, it, now it's 7 I mean, what's the impact? Immediate. I can't afford that house. I can't afford to pay eight fifty. What can you afford to pay? Based based on but you know name, normal uh, mortgage underwriting standards, um, six fifty, two hundred thousand left. Yeah, that sounds about right. But nobody's willing to give up, the, sell their home for six hundred and fifty thousand because the people that bought those homes, you know, at three percent, at least for the time being, they can, they can still afford them, even even though they purchased them at a very high price. What you have to understand, everybody, is this. No two cycles are ever the same. There's always a new twist to everyone. Prices go up during the up phase and down during the down phase. That's the only thing that you can count on. What drives those cycles is different every single time. Like why this cycle hasn't been um, had bigger um, uh, uh, price discounts is strictly because of this um, of lack of supply. Have we ever seen this, this lack of supply going back 50 years during a down cycle? Never. Not once. But the, here we are. Now we got to deal with it. And so that's, that's what's keeping housing prices buoyant. Now, and, 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 and people say, oh yeah, well, that's what's going to keep them buoyant, you know, going on because it's, it, they're permanently high. And I respond to that as follows. I look at a 50 year chart or 60 year chart of housing prices in the U.S. and in California. And you look at the chart, and you go back and see very clearly, boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust. One more time, one more time. Five boom and busts in the last 50 years. And now during the the most current, after the most current boom, people are going to say, we're not going to experience a bust? I don't think so. I don't think so. If you want to, you know, the best way to determine what's going to happen in the future is to study the past. And even though it's not perfect, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the best tool you have. And we have, we have five distinct boom and bust in California and the U.S. going back to the 1970s. And it's going to happen again. To bet that that isn't going to happen would be a very, very foolish bet to take. What's happening with mortgage defaults and foreclosures? They're gradually creeping up. You know, during the COVID, during the COVID period from 2000 to 2022, that you couldn't foreclose on a house, and even if you didn't pay your mortgage. You know, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't file a notice of default. But all of a sudden, that's all over now, and slow, and then interest rates went down to 5%, or down to, you know, sub threes. But now, slowly but surely, uh, mortgage defaults and foreclosures are starting to creep up. They haven't become a real problem yet, but the trend is up. 
and that and that everybody is one of my four, one of my five forward looking indicators the the, the, the five type Five indicators, let me tell you just so you know. Existing home sales, new home building permits, um, uh, foreclosures, more, loan defaults, interest rates, and, um, and foreclosures. Foreclosures and mortgage dip, those, those are two. Those are the five, and they're forward-looking. So they're starting to creep up. They're not still going down like they were from 2000 and um, like 2008, you know, through 2022. Now they're gradually starting to creep up. Now, when, when it, as that creeps up, who knows, you know, that, you know how dramatic the rise is going to be. But that if, if that becomes a big problem, there's your supply, guys. There's your new supply that's going to be hitting the market, and it's distressed selling. Nobody's going to sit there and go, yeah, the bank's giving me 90 days to sell my house or – um, you know, to, to make up the loan default, or they're going to foreclose. You're going to put that house on the market. And if more and more people are putting that house on the market to avoid losing it to foreclosure, in comes your supply, the, the supply and demand dynamics change, and now that it, it's more in tune with normal down cycles, and prices will start, start falling more sharply. It, it, isn't it interesting how really simple it is, Jim, <laughs> on supply and demand, which is, which is the only usable tool um, the only the only thing I learned from my degree in economics from UCLA that has any value, <laughs> supply and demand. Everything else is the, is theory, um, um, speculation, or just pure bullshit. What happens in human psychology that turns a real estate downturn into a crash? Well, see, that's what happens. It's, it's driven by psychology, really. I mean, the, so sure, the prices are driven by the dynamics of supply and demand. So what makes those dynamics change? It's market psychology. When prices are going up, everybody wants to get on board, you know, to, to you know, take advantage of, of, the, of the new wealth that's being created. And on the downside, it's just the opposite. All of a sudden, your neighbor, you know, your, the last house on the block uh, sold, for, um, sold for like 800000 bucks. And now, six months later, your neighbor's home, same exact home, sold for seven hundred. You're going, wow! I just lost a hundred thousand bucks. You know, Marge, we were thinking about selling. We need to sell, and and, and everybody, and every to, to get out before we lose even more. And all of a sudden, that that fear of loss spreads and builds up momentum. And now you're in a full blown down cycle that's self reinforcing. If the U.S. is in for a housing crash, how bad could it be? I think. The, the um, when you adjust for inflation, which and, and which is what you should do, you know, if 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 your house goes up ten percent in value and inflation goes up ten percent in value, are you ten percent richer? No, you're you're not richer at all. So it depends a lot on what inflation does. So, but let's look at it on an inflation adjusted basis. I think housing prices in the United States will probably fall in the range of forty to fifty percent. And California, I would add 10% on that. They may only fall, fall 20% nominally. Like, yeah, the house you bought, you know, at the peak at 900 grand in California, now it's worth, um, 700 grand. Yeah, okay, let's just say, yeah, that's less than, um, less than, um, a little over 20% down. Yeah, yeah, but now we now we're living with 7% inflation for the next six years. Multiply that, 7 times 6, that's 42. Uh, add 20% because of the nominal price of gone. Now you've just lost your 60%. You're down 60. You're 60% poor from, from the standpoint of the, what, the dollars you're going to get out of your house, the, um, what they can buy, you know, the purchasing power of those dollars. With work from home now being a thing along with people buying products online instead of going out shopping in a retail store, could commercial real estate be in trouble for a long time? Absolutely. I mean, let me give you a classic example. I don't know if anybody, everybody's familiar with what's going on in the Bay Area, but that's just an absolute disaster. You know, because of the crime, because of the, you know, the freaks that are running the show up there that, you know, I, that, that um, used to go and um, um, uh, enjoy going up to the city and spending a couple of days. I, I lived there for two and a half years and I enjoyed it. But all of a sudden, now all these major retailers are pulling out, are leaving, and um, that there was a uh, a, a um, office building at 350 California Street. Um, I don't know how tall it was. It was tall. It was it was uh, purchased for 320 million dollars in 2019, and it was just resold 
for $62 million, uh, less than six months ago. That's like an 80% drop in value or whatever it is. A 1,500-unit um, hotel owned by a major hotel owner, of course. Two different buildings within the city. They just walked away from it. Walked away from it. And, and the retail business, it just, it, it really sucks. And why does it suck? It, for one simple reason. One, I mean, in, in, in San Francisco, people don't want to go out like they could because they could be beat up or killed or, you know, severely injured. But also, if that's the case, that's the case everywhere. If you look at a chart, what, you know, a chart of, of the volume of sales that, they're, that, are, that, that are occurring on an online basis, it just keeps going up and up and up and up. So these shopping malls, it wouldn't surprise me if, if the, the, the business that shopping malls do, if, if their business is down 50% in the next 20 years. So there's two choices. Either the shopping malls drop the rent by 75% so that a retailer can still compete with the online shoppers, or 50% of the malls are going to go out of business. What are real estate developers doing? Real estate developers are still kicking butt. And the reason they're kicking butt is this, is that with, with existing home sales down 20 to 30 percent, people that want to buy, that, that want to buy a home, either move up or move down or a first time buyer, they, their, their only alternative is to buy a new home. So even though housing prices are, even though ha- the new home prices are coming down, the volume of sales is still holding its own. So they're doing well. Interesting. We, have we ever seen that before? No. No, we haven't. I mean, I, I, I think like 30% of all home sales right now are new home sales. What, what's the historical average? 15. 15. Double. But if, you, if there's no existing homes to buy, okay, where are you going to look? You're going to look at new homes, and they are. Boom and busts. With regards to real estate, we hear it's different this time, but is it? Never is. No, no it is. I know. You keep hearing the thing. And, and most, of the t- most of the time that people that, that, that say that, you know, are, are, the, are the, you know, the shills in the business, the stooges that are paid to say that. You know, if you listen to the, 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 the National Association of Realtors and look at a boom and bust chart, prices go up, prices go down. Prices go up, prices go down. Do they ever tell you to sell? No. It's always buy, 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 buy. And that's it. And so, you know, you can't listen to them. You can't listen to them. The boom bust cycle is, is, as, is, is as regular and reliable as any cycle. Any cycle. You know, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. Summer comes, summer goes. Winter comes, winter goes. The real estate cycle is no different. It's not, it's not as reliable as the seasonal cycles. But it still occurs, and it still occurs because that the, um, the, the price movement is driven by human psychology more than anything, more than 50%, which is fear and greed. And all of a sudden, greed gets overdone, and prices go to, high, to unsustainable highs like, the, like they are right now, like they are in Toronto, where you have to be making uh, $590,000 a year to afford a, a 1,500-square-foot home. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, prices crash, even though they haven't crashed in Canada during the last down cycle like they did in the U.S. All of a sudden, prices come screaming back down. Interest rates go down because the economy's down. And now all of a sudden, to, to afford that 1,500-square-foot home in Toronto, if they experience the U.S.-style uh, downturn, it may only take $200,000 to buy a home, which is one-third of, of today. That's the best time to buy. Would it be safe to say the bull markets in residential and commercial real estate are over? It, it's over. Mm-hmm. It's over. You know, it, it's definitely over. The um, um, and, and and what's interesting is that I've always I've always enjoyed the um, is it, it, it's been very exhilarating to me that I've made predictions. You know, most of the time, you know, very accurately that you may people don't. People don't believe you at the time, but they believe you later, that you're proven right later. Because you're looking at for, you're looking at the past, you're looking at the cyclical nature of real estate, you're looking at forward looking indicators, and it's, and rarely is it different this time, if ever. And just based on that, you can, you can make accurate forecasts. 
In early 2020, the stock markets crashed. Could the stock markets continue climbing a wall of worry higher for a number of weeks, months, or even years? Absolutely. Absolutely. They could. You know, the stock market, you know, even though I prefer the real estate market to the stock market because I know it better, I understand the cycles better, I can make more money in it consistently by buying low and selling high, um, the... Um, the um, it, it can keep climbing that wall of market for as long as you want. There's, there's no limits. Gold and silver are still in a trading range. What are your thoughts on the precious metals? I know. Well, the the I'm still a big believer, and I love I love gold and silver. I especially love gold because I think it's going to a big number to save the system. All this all this talk I'm talking about debt going crazy, and nobody's going to be able to afford it. And how's the U.S. ever going to pay back? You know. $33 trillion worth of debt. They're not. They're not. So as opposed to everybody bailing out of the debt market and saying, you can't pay it, so we don't want it. And if everybody tries to sell their debt, you know, rates wouldn't be, you know, rate wouldn't be 7%. They'd be 20%. And, to, and that would be a complete disaster to stop that from happening. What they're going to do, what I believe they're going to do, is they're going to revalue gold to back the dollar at a big number. And it's going to be 25000 bucks or more per ounce. How important is playing big, and what does that mean? Oh yeah, now you're now you're now you're talking my language. Hey, everybody, that that um, just a couple weeks ago, a 29 year old kid from Colorado won the U.S. Open in Los Angeles. It was so amazing. It's first big tournament ever. And afterwards, he was crying, and he and when, when he was interviewed, and he said, he goes. How do you feel? And he goes, I feel great. He said, every tournament that I play in. He, he, he started, he played in the Pro Tour back in 2017. So he's been playing, you know, what, you know, six years. Finally won his first major. He said, my mom was my biggest supporter. And before every tournament, she used to tell me, play big, play big. And, and his mom, when he was 19, um, his mom died. She was 55. But that's what he always remembers about his mom. He said, she always told me to play big, and I always tell you, and I always did play big. And the lesson, guys, is this. Whatever you do, play big. Play to win. And if you're not going to play big, forget about it. Find something you can. Some, find something you can do to play big, whatever it is. And with respect to real estate, what I call playing big is this. It doesn't mean you're out there beating the bushes for deals, good times or bad times. No. Playing big is having the, the discipline and the patience to, to let the cycles do their thing. And when the cycles take prices down and you're smart enough to, to, smart enough to uh, identify the bottom, and when it's time to buy, play big. That's the time to put on leverage, guys. Leverage, leverage, leverage can kill you during bad times, but it can be your, your best friend during good times. Buy, buy one property or two properties down at the Micah Cycle Bottom, put on the leverage, put on the leverage, ride the cycle up, and you'll make more money doing that than you will doing anything else. And I call that playing big. And it's just like, I'm a big baseball fan. Baseball is my best sport. You look at Major League Baseball players. Every one of those guys in the major leagues plays big. Every one of them. That's a tough position to be in. I think there's 500 of them in the whole baseball players in the whole world that are good enough to make the majors, them make the majors, make the show. Every one of those guys plays big, and they got there by playing big. So that's 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 um, that's uh, my new my new motto that I'm putting on my refrigerator door. Play big, whatever you do. And if anybody says you can't do it. Forget it. I'll, I'm, I'll do it. Just watch me. Watch me. Right or wrong. I'm, are you going to fail? Yeah, you're going to fail. Of course you are. Will you, with that kind of attitude and assuming you give it all you've got, will you be successful more than you, more than you fail? By a long shot. But the only way you're going to get ahead in life, guys, is to play big. Do you have any health tips for us? Let's see. Health tips? Boy, we need some health tips here in the United States. The, yeah, you know, my, because do you know the the longevity of the average man in the United States has dropped from like seventy seven years down to like uh, seventy four years in the last in the last uh, um, less than ten years. We're going downhill. So you know, what my health tip is: avoid alcohol, avoid drugs, exercise, get a lot of sunshine, 
and keep good people in your life, only good people. If somebody wants to be a screw-up and that doesn't deserve to be in your life, kick them out. That's, that's mental health, guys. So it's more than just going to the gym and lifting weights or, you know, doing sprints to, 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 to increase your heart. It's, it's mental health, too. And let me tell you something. I just finished a really, really good book, and I, I'd recommend you guys that are health-oriented that or would like to be health-oriented that you read. It's called um, Grain Brain. Grain Brain. That I hardly eat any carbs because I'm at that point in my life that carbs just add, you know, carbs just put fat on you. And if you don't believe me, read the Bible. It's in there. I'm just joking. <laughs> but you know what does? That keeping thin and healthy, it's not only a physical thing. It's a mental thing. It makes you smarter. It keeps you smarter. That people that keep, people that keep lean and exercise that the chance of them uh, succumbing to Alzheimer's or dementia is dramatically lower. So what you got to do, guys, is you got you got to put the odds in your favor. You got to you got to work out. You got to be healthy. You got to eat right. So it's not only good physical physically for us guys. So more chicks look at you, but mentally you'll be much stronger. I mean, I'm amazed. If, a lot of people my age, I'm 76, just turned 76. If everybody's going, oh, yeah, I had, I'm having senior moments. I haven't had a senior moment in my life. My memory is, is probably as good, if not better today, than it was, you know, 50 years ago. So why, how did that happen? It's all because I take care of myself. All because I take care of myself. I eat good food. I eat less. I exercise. I kick crappy people out of my life, and all of a sudden, you, may, you keep a, and, and, and also the fact that you have to have goals, everybody. You have to have goals. There has to be something out there that's bigger than you, bigger than you. Like, I, I wrote my first book in 2002, and I sold 31,000 copies. I have a second book that I have to write. I have to, because I've, I've tripled my level of knowledge. Is, is writing a book fun? No. It's the most miserable thing anybody can ever do. It took me, it, I had to wake up every morning for a year and a half, and I worked on my book between 5 in the morning and 7 in the morning, two hours every day for a year and a half before I pumped out a book, before it was good enough for me to take the print. Books are hard. But all of a sudden, you've got to go, look, I need to share this with the people. I want people to, to know what I learned what I learned, and you know what, and, and if it's good information, oh, people will pay up, guys. People will pay up. And so it, so it serves a multiple purpose. You can say, look what I know, and people go, wow. If you, if you looked at my book on Amazon, Timing the Real Estate Market, you would see that I would say, what, 95% of the people gave me a five-star rating. Read the comments. They go, this book is excellent. It's excellent. And they go, is this easy to do? No. Of course it's not. What, 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 good, what, what good things in life come easy? Zero. Zero. But if you want to get ahead in life, you got to try. you got to put in the work. you got to think big. you got to stay in shape. And if you do all those things, everybody, you have a chance. If you, don't, if you do none of those things, you have no chance. So that's the challenge. That's the challenge that, 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 I'm, that I'm living, um, that, that I'm going toward in life. And it, it's all based, it starts with health. Because so you, you're not going to be successful in life if you lose your brain power. That ain't going to happen. Nope, ain't going to happen. The, so you got you got to keep healthy so you keep a strong brain. Then you have to have the motivation to go, you know, to play big. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. Yeah. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to play, I'm going to play, you know, I'm going to play in an over 65, uh, fast pitch hardball league. Yeah, I'm going to do that. How many, how many guys my age do that? As far as I know, they're the only one. I'm the only one because the only league I've found so far is the, 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 the age is 55. And I'm not sure I can compete against guys that are over 20 years younger than me because I know a lot of ex, uh, pro base, major league baseball players that are 20 years younger than me. And I know they can still play. The pitchers can still throw the ball, and if somebody was, if I was at the plate and one of those guys, ex-pitchers, threw a baseball and it got out of control and came at me at let's just say seventy miles an hour, which isn't that fast, and it hit me, I'd get hurt. 
I, I can't get out of the way, Jim. That, I'm a, I mean, your reactions do slow down, right? Yeah, that's why I stopped playing uh, pickup hockey with former Canucks. Yeah. I can't get out of the way of trouble anymore. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I mean, all of a sudden the ball's coming at you and you just go, oh, oh. and I don't want to get hit by a 70-mile-an-hour fastball. It's not going to kill me, I don't think. <laughs> it could. So you, you, you have to know your limitations to a degree. So th- those are, those are my, my health and success tips, everybody. Bob, where can people follow you, buy your book, Timing the Real Estate Market, and subscribe to your newsletter? Go to my website, realestatetiming.com, just like it sounds, realestatetiming.com, and you can read a little bit about me and, and see what I have to offer and, um, and see what you think. Bob, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you very much, Jim. Always enjoy it. Bye. My guest has been Robert Campbell, publisher of the realestatetiming.com newsletter. He was speaking to us from beautiful San Diego. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Victor Adair, and Robert Campbell. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Wishing everyone a happy Canada Day and a great July 4th. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen.